Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching or listening to this, and welcome to this week's episode of the Non-Identity Podcast. Now, this week we're joined by a comedian who six years ago uprooted everything and uh, came to the UK on his home. It's Stia. Hi, Stia. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, before we get into what, uh, your comedy and stuff, can you just explain to people who you are and where you grew up and stuff? Yes. Um, I grew up in Portugal, in a small town in Portugal, in the north of Portugal. Um, my entire life, or most of my entire life, was born and raised in that small town. And um, then, uh, suddenly, the opportunity arrived for me to travel to the UK for studies, which ended up me enjoying more comedy than the studies, so that's that's <laughs> funny as well. And um, like we said, you came to the UK about six years ago, so obviously you've just set it in and then COVID happened. How did you find that? It happened that during the COVID and because university at the time, I had my best friends living with me and oh. we share the same house. We are studying different courses. So that helped a little bit, having friends, people that you meet at those circumstances in university, college, whatever it is, that, that helped a little bit. For the sanity. And uh, what was it about the UK that made you want to come here? Uh, at the time, that was the only thing available for me because um, that opportunity arrived. I didn't even thought about uh, going to study, for pursuing further studies. So when it came that opportunity, it came that uh, announcement of, oh, you can study in the UK and it's easier to with your marks, with your degree, with whatever your achievements are in high school, to get in the UK academic than in Portugal. Portugal is very demanding. So when I thought about it, I was like, I truly want to follow something in law, but I didn't have the classifications, what is needed to, to do that in Portugal. And um, as we said earlier, you're a comedian, but like you said, you just study law. What was the transition? Because it seems weird to be serious, study law, and then go into comedy. <laughs> It's it's a bit weird, yes, I agree. And every time that I talk about what I, I did before the degrees, um, I started in law, um, then I changed to cybersecurity, and not of those, nothing of those has to do with comedy, and I'm aware of that, but I don't know, I just always fell in love with comedy, making people laugh, always been part of me, even unconsciously. I always try to make people laugh, I always try to make people feel better, even when I was not feeling okay about myself, but I always felt that I should be useful in that way. And I always enjoy going to watch stand-up comedy shows, so that was the main reason to start in stand-up. Was it one of those situations where you're watching the shows thinking, yes, I want to do that and be on stage, or was you having people tell you you're quite funny, so you should go and do stand-up? was the second option. I had a couple of friends that I met in my first year in the UK that... Um, told me, oh, you are so funny, you're always telling jokes, why you don't try stand-up? I was like, I don't think I can, I'm, I'm too shy, I'm too introvert for, for that. But they keep insisting, and I was like, I don't have anything to lose, so let's try, and if nothing else, is an experience. And from then on, it's, it's what it's been so far, it's three years doing comedy and going all around the world, trying to, to spare joy. How did you get your first show, like, was it just you broke off? Was it an open mic? How did you take that first step into actually going onto the stage? It was an open mic in Portsmouth in the south of the UK. Um, and I just, I found out about the comedy because I was walking by and I saw a poster. It was like, comedy night. I was like, oh, nice. I didn't even know that Portsmouth had comedy. So I tried to reach to the promoter. I tried to find the social medias of the promoter and ask, I don't know how to do stand-up, where to do stand-up. Is there any place that I can start I really want to do? And the promoter just said to me that I could start on that night or a few weeks later or something like that, if I remember correctly. And then what was the process? Do you write all your material down or do you just write bullet points of what you want to hear? How do you put together a little stand-up routine? Uh, I I do a mix of both. I write a lot. I tend, if I can, I try to write 30 minutes of material every week. And then I go testing the material and from then try to filter what works, what doesn't. But also I leave space on my stand-up comedy routines to improvise and to 
in interact in certain way with the audience because I feel that I want to make the show unique every time that I, I'm performing. And if I'm just doing a, a script, just telling a, a, a joke or the same jokes all the time, uh, the show is not unique. It's just a repetitive um, script, if you can say. When I watched one of your stand-ups earlier on, um, you, you give a persona of quite a deadpan. You sort of take the mic out of yourself, but you're quite deadpan and serious. Was that a conscious effort or is that just come naturally to you? No, it's it's a conscious effort because my one of my inspirations is Monty Python, so it's it's trying to go on that style, but try to convert to stand up. What do you draw your inspirations on? Is it life experiences or is it things you see happen to other people? I I read a lot, so that like the scientific knowledge comes to me towards reading, and sometimes I just go on a walk. I like walk walking and hiking and uh, a lot of, of uh, weird things come to me and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to note this down and then if I can make a joke, that's nice. That's normally how. As you said earlier on, you've done a lot of touring. What places have you been to and what was your favourite? Um, I've done mostly around the UK. I've been up to Cambridge, to, to those sites. Not... I didn't went north yet, north from, from Cambridge, but Cambridge has been the far away from the south. And Cambridge, to be honest, has been the most, the, 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 one, the place that I had most fun. I truly enjoy going there. Uh, the crowds are amazing. And my first special was recorded over there as well. So, And apart from that, I recently did a tour show in, in Portugal. I, I wanted to go to Portugal to visit my parents, and also I took the opportunity of booking a couple of gigs and trying to do either in Portuguese or, or in, in English. And uh, when you're writing your material, how close to the line do you want to go? Because I, I noticed in one of your stand-ups, you mentioned a, a joke about not being Jesus, but you've nailed it. Port Portugal, <laughs> Portugal's quite a religious country, so that was yeah. quite a risky joke to say. But how do you get that feeling that you know it's okay to say that? Or do you think, I'm just going to say it, if they like it, they like it, if they don't, they don't? To be honest, that was one of the jokes that I was not sure if I was to put on the last special because of that, the religious. But the reaction, I, I did that joke over a couple of crowds, and the reaction was always good. So I was like, I don't think people will find the malicious way in here. It's just a joke. Right. I'm not trying to mock religion. Everyone believes in whatever they want to believe. It's just a joke. It's just playing with words. That's always my, my goal. And I think because of your style where you, you sort of take the mickey out yourself quite a lot, as you said, it, it, it didn't come across very malicious. It was more dig it yourself. Is there any time that you wrote a joke and thought, oh, this is going to be brilliant and it hasn't gone down well? And what do you do when that happens? Oh, there are so many. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> that's that's the thing. Is always that's why I I always try to write at least thirty minutes of material every week if I can, because there is jokes that I think this is gonna be brilliant, and I go on stage and people don't understand, or it's too complex, and I'm like, okay, we'll try to work that on another time. Maybe I need another angle. Maybe I need another experience, and I always. Let's put it this way. I always throw that in the garbage. Like I have a, 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 no, a notepad that has all of that, all of the premises. And like my actual writing um, paper, or, or if you want to say that way, just has the jokes that I say at the time. So if that doesn't work, I just throw up. And then it's like, years later or something, I will try it again to see the notepad and it's like, oh, okay, I have this. I think I try to do something with that. Let me try with a different angle. So I always have the premises there, but if it doesn't work, I just don't bother too much and I just focus on the ones that work. When you write a joke, how do you structure it? Do you start with a punchline and work backwards or do you start with the beginning and get to the punchline? How do you structure your jokes? That's, I think... That would be a tricky question, and uh, for every comedian, there is a different process of everyone. Um, for mine, it depends. If he's an onliner, sometimes um, it just comes the structure all the way. It's just like, oh, this needs to be this exact structure because if the, if not, doesn't work. But if he's like a long format joke, 
a long abstract comedy style, I would say that is more like a small percentage of the premise happen. And I wrote that and then I tried to create the fictional side of it. I think it goes more towards that, that side. And obviously you said uh, you get a lot of inspiration from Monty Python. What other comedians um, is your humour that, that you like to watch? From the UK, I would say Ross Novel is among those. Yeah. I, I really love his style. And um, I went to see him this year and I had the best time of my life. Was I would dare to say was the best uh, comedy stand-up uh, show that I ever seen. It's just very entertaining, and uh, he can keep an audience always in the um, the, palm, the palm of his hands. So he's always entertaining that. Um, there is others that I would get inspired by, a lot of American comedians, and Portuguese too, but uh, like Eddie Izzard as well. It's, yeah. it's an interesting uh, perspective. Um, I'm very bad with names. I'm trying to remember and try to make... I don't know if you've heard of a comedian called James A. Caster. He's one of my yes. favourites. I love, I love it. Yeah, yeah, he's he's one of mine. Yeah, that that kind of style inspires me to write stuff like more surreal, more abstract. I really love that style. But also I love like comedians like Bill Burr, like that is just more straight to the line, very edgy, that sort of stuff. Always trying to push the limits. That that's always fascinating to see comedians that do all sorts of spectrums and uh, that you can draw inspiration. But normally, for me, when I draw inspiration to what I do on stage, it, I go more towards bands. I I enjoy watching a lot of that metal concerts, metal concerts. So going to bands and see how they put their shows together, that kind of inspires me to know. If I can adapt certain language, certain body language, that sort of things. Because we're headed into a world where people have to be so careful of what they say with this cancel culture, do you think that comedy is still going to be able to have a place or do you think it's going to die down? No, I think we'll have the place more and more because I think the, the woke culture is just online. When I go to perform a show... There is not that. People that are there want to have that edgy feeling of like, oh, that's risky, but that's funny. And um, so I never felt on the show like that edgy of like, oh, you push too much. I had jokes that I had to take out because of social media. Were like, oh, okay, these might not work on social media. But on a stage, people are like, oh, that's bad, but this is funny. So I think we'll have place because people enjoy getting out of the house and feel like oh someone is telling something that we can't so they are daring to say that stuff that's funny and that uh, hour or two hours whatever is the show like just having that that moment to relax and not think about life no 100% um, like I said earlier as well I've watched a couple of stuff on your YouTube channel uh, what is your YouTube channel and what sort of stuff content are you putting out my YouTube is Steer Productions. You probably will put in the the, the description. Um, yeah. um, that's where I mainly produce content. It's more vlogging and stand-up. It's just the things that I like to do. I try before, like in experimental time, try to do a bunch of things, but I found out that the only thing that I truly love producing and editing is comedy, because it's always fun to go on stage and try to, to do new things. And the vlogging, in my opinion, it can be so much things in just one. So it allows me to be creative and tell a story in, in different uh, ways all the time. And um, what's coming up for you for the rest of the year? Uh, recently, when we are recording this, and you mentioned about uh, the short special that I released now, um, hopefully I have a couple of more ideas for a few a few others as well. Um, I'm moving to London, so I hope I can record more vlogging stuff about like um, underground places. Like, especially London has so much underground history that they do tours about it, and I really want to to go and and understand and know the the history. So, if possible, try to record something. 
I really love to show, especially the UK with the vlogging thing, I really love to show people that the UK is just not the main thing of London, not not just the big band, not just the the um, the main the main attractions. I love going outside and just seek for history, just seek for places that most people wouldn't dare or wouldn't be able. I don't think able is, is the word, but more maybe they don't seek for it. So if that comes comes to them and is like, oh, this is fun, let's let's bring more tourism for places that deserve instead of packing all together in just one place. No, I totally agree with that. So obviously I live probably about a 40 minute train ride from London. So we're quite close. But when I get to central London, I actually feel like a tourist myself. <laughs> which is really, which is really weird because like you said, you go to your big Ben or you go to your uh, Buckingham Palace, but you don't really know what else is about in London. And that's for people who actually live just on the outside of London. If you're not in the city, yeah. you don't really know what's going on. So I think, yeah, I think like bringing up little hidden gems would be a really good, a really yeah, good and, content. And I truly don't, I don't enjoy like, if I go to, to visit something, I don't enjoy spending hours and hours just online on a queue waiting for something. I'm like, yeah. I just want to go on this hiking track or something and be relaxed. And if I need to interact with people, nice, but just clear my mind out of everything that is going on in the world, this chaos. Exactly. And do you think you enjoy the hiking because... You're on stage around people a lot, and it's just nice to be on your own sometimes and get to know yourself, really. Is that why you enjoy the hiking so much? I think so. I think I need that balance of, okay, I'm too social in this context, so I need the, the other part that is just like, I'm just alone with myself and just relaxing and just trying to not overthink about every aspect that I need to do. And especially in comedy or entertainment industry, you always need to be nice when you're in those social environments. And sometimes you're not for that. So you need to get out of those places and be alone. And it's like, oh, here I don't need to pretend that I'm nice. Here I don't need to pretend to be someone else because I need to sell tickets or something around those those lines of thoughts. So I, th I think we'll go around those 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 main aspects, I think. And um, also, if you're having a bad day where you don't feel yourself, but you've got a show that evening and you've got to go out and make other people laugh, how do you get yourself through that? I just think it's another day. It's like any other job. It's just need to do it. <laughs> and uh, sometimes pays off. People appreciate it. And in the end, it's like, oh, that made my day. Someone coming to me and say, oh, this was the best show that I saw. Or, or this was... this. I really needed that. I remember one show that... I think I slept two hours uh, in the whole night before. And I had work. I had an early uh, job that I, I had to wake up earlier. And the show was at eight. So I had to travel up to Brighton at the time, from Portsmouth to Brighton, which is still a long journey to go to do like a, a small show for people. And I was like, why am I doing this? I was my way to on the train. I'm like, why am I doing this? Why, why do I need this? And I did my part. I did my show. And in the end of it, people came to me and was like, oh, I really needed that. I really needed that. That was really good. And that made me feel a little bit less stress and let us like, oh, okay. The, the lack of sleep is the last thing here. Nice. I made someone happy. Someone that came here with a purpose to laugh and distract themselves. That's that's nice. That's what I always try to think. And plus, I feel that um, when I'm in stage, I, I'm comfortable. I like in a small bubble. So that helps to like, oh, okay, I'm doing something that I love. This helps relieving the stress or even the anxiety outside of this. Everything bad that comes outside of this is not in this moment, in this bubble. So... After that, I might need to worry. It's like, oh, I performed this. Oh, fuck. I still need to, to deal with these papers. But at that moment, I'm just like, oh, I'm leaving this. I need to entertain these people. So it keeps me busy. No, 100%. Well, Steve, we're coming to the end of this conversation. It's been a really fascinating conversation. But I've got one last question. And this question I ask every guest. If you could be remembered for one word and one word only, what would it be and why? Unique. Trying to be unique, trying to be someone that uh, people will remember and not just another one. 
because every show that I do, uh, and I, I mentioned that in the beginning, I always try to um, be different. I always try to to create something that is unique on that that moment. And being remembered as that unique artist, it's I think nowadays is more easy to to be someone that copies works from others that be unique. So that original be original. I think that's my aspiration, Ori. No, well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, guys, make sure you check out Steer's YouTube channel with the link uh, below. And um, when you move down to London, as I said, I'm right nearby, so hopefully we can meet up and do something. 